I was getting into that gospel choir. I don't know about you. It might be Saturday afternoon, but we're having church up in here. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I, I love what's happening. It's a gift to our city. And, uh, you know, last year at the Justice Conference out west, I brought a friend of mine, Ben Cohen, who started Ben and Jerry's Ice Cream, and we brought ice cream for everybody. And we talked about the military economy a little bit. And uh, so I thought this year we got to do something a little bit different. And so I brought an AK-47 and uh, some welder friends. So give it up for my friends, Mike and Fred. They're going to join me up here. These guys, like Mike drove all the way out from uh, Colorado or something, right? Yeah, with, with um, because he had to bring all that stuff. And, and these days it's hard to get a forge and an AK on an airplane. So he drove all this stuff out. And a, a year or so ago, Ben Cohen and I, we, we had this idea that we need to evoke the, the prophet's idea that we turn swords into plowshares or these days that we might turn our guns into farm tools. And then as we were preparing this year, I heard about these guys that are blacksmiths. So I, I don't even know quite what this thing is, but we, they, they came out and they said, we got this vision and I want you to hear a little about it. It's called Raw Tools. And uh, tell us where that comes from, Mike. Well, it's uh, meditating on the vision of Isaiah 2-4 and turning swords into plowshares and teaching people to learn of war no more. So taking weapons and turning them into garden tools to be used for creation and peace. Pretty sweet, huh? Now, you know, some, some might ask, um, well, where are you going to get AK-47s? Like, how are you going to get these semi-automatic weapons? Uh, are you going to, like, buy them, you know, off eBay or at the local gun shop? But where, where, where's your idea that you're going to get these or you've been getting them? Uh, we are asking people to donate them around the uh, maybe Mennonite churches. That's where we affi we're affiliated with. And we're also going to work with local communities and authorities to get the weapons that have been used in criminal activity. So when they're done with the litigation process, instead of being scrapped and made into sewer caps, we want to intercede there and take them and, and kind of use a, a redemptive vision for them and put them in community gardens or local housing projects, things like that. It's pretty sweet. So now... Um, one of the things that you told me was that some of the metal that was used from September 11th, I think, went somewhere else than farm tools. And tell, tell me about that. In 2009, they took some steel from the, the two towers and they turned it into a bow stem, used it for the USS New York that was commissioned for the, the military. And that really kind of helped spark me to keep going and to pursue this vision and look for something better to, to respond to violence when, or threats. Pretty sweet. So now here was the idea, was that we were actually going to do this as a live conversion while I preached. We were going to convert a weapon. We had a little bit of a tr trouble with what they call fire code. Crazy idea, you know. And so, uh, but honestly, the folks at the conference center have been so sweet with us. Uh, we, we ended up having to troubleshoot a little bit. So what we did was we called our friends around the corner at the Quaker building, the AFSC, and they're like, heck yeah, you can do it here, you know, like, who cares if you burn down the, like, national monument around the corner? But, you know, like, that's the, there. we did it in their building, so you don't get to see it live. But what you are going to see, this happened today right outside of this building at the AFSC. Show us, Fred, what you guys started out with. This is an AK-47. That's a, a replica. The one that they used today was a real one. It's really, it's really eerie to touch one of these after... Um, the recent massacres, because this is almost identical to the weapons that have been used uh, to hurt so many. And the AK-47 that you used was obviously not this one, but where did you get that gun? There was a lawyer in Colorado Springs who uh, knew a mutual friend, peace activist, and he had an AK-47 that he didn't feel like he wanted anymore. So he decided he didn't want to reintroduce it into the gun market and that would be just as bad as uh, keeping it himself. So he turned it over to us and we'll be uh, making a few tools out of it as well and donating it to a local community garden. So the great thing is you can actually um, make multiple tools out of one of these. And, and some would say, okay, is this like kind of artsy, you know, you're going to hang it on your wall or, or like are these tools really, are you going to be able to use them? 
Yeah, the, the intent is to use them, and we're also going to be tracking each tool from its gun. So we'll take a serial number or assign the, the tool a number, and then we'll be able to show the story of an AK-47, what it was used for, and then compare it to maybe how many pounds of food are being grown with the new tools. So how many people can you feed, or instead of how many people can you kill? So. We're going to lay that sucker right there ready to be smashed. It's in the next, uh, the next in line, but we're going to show some pictures of what they did today at the AFSC. And do you want to see what the, this is the before, you want to see the after? So Fred, bring that, bring that thing out for us. Look at this as you see the pictures of how they did it. That I feel like I could use in my garden. And, uh, that's, that's what it's meant to be. So that was made, what, Fred, right out of the, the barrel here. So we're going to take that one, and you've got, some of you got these little cards that on one side you'll see more information about the transformation of weapons. And at our table, you can bid on this. I know you can buy one of these suckers for $5, but it's the vision and the dream, right, that we want to support. So you can bid on that one and take it home today. Uh, a, a little farm tool made, a garden tool made at the Justice Conference by these guys and continue to track raw tools. We're excited about the conversion of weapons. Amen. All right. Bless you guys. So more on that later, but what I want to talk about for the next little bit that we have is the ramifications of grace. I think that the backdrop of violence and sin in the world is the, and, and all of the culture and epidemic of death is this beautiful vision and hope of grace and love. And uh, as we read Romans, it says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Uh, life and through the love and, and redemption of Jesus. And so I think that uh, part of what we need in the world right now is a consistent ethic of life that says every human being is created in the image of God. So I asked the AFSC, the Quakers around the corner, I said, when, I, when we do this, it's actually really beautiful that we had this bridge because the Quakers have known this for a long time. They freed their slaves a hundred years before anyone else did. They knew it was right. They have been advocates for life. And so I said, can you tell us a little bit about the Quakers, you know? And so this is what she said in a little text message here. It says, Quakers understand the most central belief is that good and that of God is in every person. The basic tenet leads us to oppose everything that destroys life. We believe in the goodness of all people. Original sin may be true, but so is original innocence. And so we fought to end slavery, segregation, homophobia, unjust immigration, militarism. Philadelphia was founded by Quakers. On the top of City Hall is William Penn, who was a Quaker, and they said, my thumb is getting tired. Let me stop there. Have a good session. So that's, the, that, that's this tradition that we come from. And yet, it's a lot different sometimes from what I learned in Sunday school. You know, I grew up in East Tennessee. That's why I don't have a Philly accent. And, um, but I can remember, you know, learning in Sunday school, David, a man after God's own heart, sometimes. But then you read like two chapters of the Bible, and David was a sinner. You know, like he breaks every one of the top ten in like two chapters. The, I mean, he, he lusts, he covets, he commits adultery, and then he kills. He ends up having the husband of Bathsheba killed to cover up all that he had done. Let me just say on a side note that before David had Bathsheba or took Bathsheba, he already had seven wives. I mean, like, the brother was a womanizer. Oh, I'm, but, you know, I mean, like, he killed. He was a sinner, and yet he hears the rebuke of God, and he hears the whisper of grace. He goes on to write half the chapters of Psalms. The biggest book in the Bible was written by David, a murderer. 
So I'm here to say today, we got to re recover that grace. Even if you've had seven wives and killed somebody, the gospel is still good news today. That this good news is that mercy triumphs over judgment and no one is beyond redemption. I think of Saul of Tarsus, right? Saul. Saul was by every definition a terrorist. He went door to door trying to kill the Christians. He oversaw the execution of the first martyr, this young man named Stephen. Saul was there. And I think it's no coincidence that Stephen cried out, God, forgive him. God, forgive him. He doesn't know what he's doing. Stephen had heard that one before, you know, and, and, uh, and then the next chapter is about Saul's conversion, so radical that he changes his name, and he writes, I'm the chief of sinners. He knew sin, and yet he knew and tasted the grace of God, and he writes so passionately about grace. He goes on to write half the New Testament was written and by, by, by Paul, right? You go, if we believe terrorists are re beyond redemption, we should just rip out half the New Testament because it was written by one. This is the gospel of grace, right? I think maybe that's why Jesus chose Peter. Peter was, a, I mean, the brother's always messing things up. You know, he's speaking out of turn. And like Peter, like, has heard the Sermon on the Mount from the man himself, you know, and he's like uh, walked with Jesus year after year, and then the soldiers come. And Peter's instinct is still, still to pick up his sword, and he, he picks up the sword, and he cuts off one of the guy's ears. I think probably the first thing Jesus did was go, Peter, you need to work on your aim, man. And no, probably not, but you know, like, like Jesus scolds Peter, and he goes, no, you still don't get it. You pick up the sword, you die by the sword. That's not what this is about. This is about love. And then he picks up the ear. <laughs> Pretty cool, right? Pops it back on the guy. That's sweet, right? Like, uh, but he scolds Peter. And the, uh, the early Christians understood that so well. They said, when Jesus disarmed Peter, he disarmed every one of us. Because if ever there was a person who had a, a decent case for justified violence to protect the innocent, Peter had it. And yet what Jesus teaches us is that there is something worth dying for, but there's nothing worth killing for. And that's what Peter does. He doesn't kill for Jesus. He ends up dying for Jesus. He dies for the sake of the gospel. That's what love does, right? And as we think of that, I think how beautiful it is that, I, I think, you know, of the disciples, you know, if, if Peter ever started to think a little something about himself, you know, and he's like, I'm the rock of the church, what? You know, I think all the disciples would be like, dude, remember when you cut that dude's ear off? Stupid, you know, like, so that, that humility, God works through broken vessels like David and Saul and Peter and grace is so redemptive, isn't it? The world is starved for grace. It might not be our natural instinct. But I think of that man who had his ear cut off, right? Think of dinner that night with the family, right? Kids, how was your day? Kids are like, pretty good. I got a lot of Aramaic him homework, you know, like, how's your day, Dad? Dad's like, weird, you know, like, we, we went to arrest this guy, and then one of his bros, like, uh, picked up a sword and cut my ear off, but then the guy that we came to arrest put my ear back on. Like, he was scarred by grace, right? He'll tell that story the rest of his life, and I think it's, it's harder and harder to hate when we've tasted of grace, it's, it, the early Christian said grace has the power to dull even the sharpest sword. I think of those movements like the civil rights movement. The power came from the 
the ability to suffer with those who suffer and to expose injustice so that everybody has to respond. That people begin to see folks that are beat down because of the color of their skin uh, and see people squirted in the streets with water hoses and people begin to go, that is not right. And we begin to rise up. And I, I think but part of the power of it was Dr. Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and others and they were saying uh, that this is a movement of love. And they said, we look into the eyes of those who hate us and we say, we love you. You can burn down our houses and we will still love you. You can throw us in jail and we will still love you. You can threaten the lives of our children and we will still love you. But be ye assured that we will wear you down by our love. We will wear you down by our love. And that's what grace does. I think of... Uh, as I think of Jesus, I mean, I can't help but think like everywhere Jesus goes, he interrupts hatred and condemnation. I, one of my favorite, I mean, it's, this story starts out rocky, but it's one of my favorite stories that there's this woman that's caught in the midst of adultery, apparently, and she's drug out before the town and she's humiliated. Some of you know this story, right? She, all the guys have gathered around with their stones ready to kill her. And it was a capital crime. They had a right legally to kill her, but that doesn't mean it's right, you know? And so they're standing around with their stones ready, and Jesus enters the circle of men ready to kill this woman. And the first thing he does is strange. He bends down in the dirt, you know, and he starts writing. And we were, we were asking some of the kids, what do you think, what, what's up with that? You know, what, what do you think Jesus was writing in the dirt? And uh, one of the kids said, maybe he was writing, if this doesn't work, run, woman. <laughs> I think, maybe, you know, I, I don't know. We don't know exactly what he did in the dirt, but we know what he did next. And what he did next was dazzle them all with grace. He says, let the one who is without sin cast the first stone. And then, of course, he'll remind them and all of us, if you've looked at someone with lust in your eyes, you've committed adultery. If you've called someone a fool, you're a murderer in your heart. None of us is beyond redemption, and none of us is above reproach. And you see the, the, the stones start to fall, and all the guys walk away and scatter. It's awesome. It's just Jesus and the woman. He's like, where'd they all go? And the only one who's left with any right to throw a stone has absolutely no desire. And we can see that the closer we are to God, the less we want to throw stones at people. And when we think of that, how it must break God's heart that sometimes we Christians have been the first people to pick up our stones and point our fingers and rally the drums of war and baptize bombs all in the name of the God of love and the Prince of Peace. Have mercy on us. And I think, oh, this is a beautiful thing that's happening. And the Justice Conference is a sign of that, of this uprising of love, this bubbling up of grace in the world. I, uh, I got a letter from a friend of mine who was, uh, he's in prison, and it, he admittedly said he, he did something terrible, and uh, he faced the death penalty for what he did. And uh, he said, but you got to hear my story, and, and he told it to me, and he said, I'm alive today because of grace. And he said the, the victim's family, they were Christians. And so all through court, they argued that I was not beyond redemption. They argued that God might not be done with me yet. They argued that we're all better than the worst things that we do. And he said, that's why I'm alive today. I was spared the death penalty because of the victim's family. He said, I wasn't a Christian then, but I am now. He tasted that grace. So it's not just an ideological debate this is, conference isn't just about issues and rhetoric. It's about the integrity of the gospel and the fact that the gospel spreads through love and through grace and through people who walk alongside those while they're down. And I think today, 
as we think about restorative justice. We think about, I mean, just a, around the corner from here is one of the first prisons in the United States, but it was called a penitentiary because the hope was that it would, it, with the same word repentance, that people would rethink their lives and be entered into society again, not to warehouse people in prison, but to restore not just them, but everything that's broken in the world so that we don't have to have penitentiaries anymore. And we think of death penalty. And I think, my gosh, I think something's happening right now. You know, like, yeah, there's still 29 states that execute people, but there's 21 that have stopped. And this year, Connecticut abolished the death penalty. I, I'm starting to think uh, we might be able to be the generation that abolishes the death penalty. Because check this out, what if... I mean, there's some, like, tweeter experts up in here, you know, like, like uh, Facebook and all this stuff. I'm kind of new at that, uh, that, some of that. But, like, can you imagine if we had an execution alert that every time someone is, was about to be killed, we let folks know, like, and, and, a, and a bunch of Christians showed up to say, we don't believe in this. We believe in the gospel of love and grace, and we were all spared death because of what happened on the cross. Can you imagine? Can you imagine if there was a little execution alert? Because right now we're, we're executing about 50 people a year in the U.S. And if we begin to show up and pray and vigil all with nonviolence and love and maybe even kneel down on our knees and get in front of those cars that we're coming to kill because there's something wrong with the myth of redemptive violence, of trying to kill that show that, to show that killing is wrong. Our, our friend Derek Webb. Who's an artist? Y'all know that name? He, uh, he sing, sings a song called uh, Killing to Show That Killing is Wrong. It's try, try, like trying to teach righteousness through fornication. That there's, there's something out of whack with that, that, that actually what we see in Jesus is what love looks like when it stares evil in the face. And it is beautifully redemptive and says, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. So I just got to go over to... Um, Kabul in uh, Afghanistan, and I was one of the people, I, I was with these heroic kids in Afghanistan, but one of the people I got to spend some time with was uh, a guy named uh, John Deere, and John Deere was a good friend of Mother Teresa's. He's a uh, uh, Jesuit and uh, a Catholic, you know, monk kind of guy, and he's a great guy. He's written all kinds of great books, but when we were over there, he said, I want to tell you a story, and he said, Mother Teresa and I, we had a little conspiracy. And he said every time uh, there was about to be an execution in one of the states, I would call Mother Teresa and I would say, you need to call the governor. And she would do it. She would call the governor. And that put them in a very awkward position, right? Because you're like, governor, it's Mother Teresa on the phone. Either mother, the, the governor's going to say, nah, I'm busy, you know, or, or the governor's going to say, I'll talk to her. And when he talked to her, you know what Mother Teresa said? Mother Teresa would say to him, do what Jesus wants you to do. Uh, be faithful to Jesus. And, 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 and one of the governors said, I'm not about to kill after that phone call. And so Mother Teresa came to John Deere, and she, he said, it was very awkward. She came up to me, and she said, let's dance. We saved a life. And they started dancing together, and they said, we saved a life. We saved a life. And I, I long for the day that we might be able to say, we saved a life. Because we, we put our bodies, our gifts, our Twitter skills in the way of the pa Twitter skills, in the way of those things that are, are preaching a different gospel than the gospel of love and grace. I think of our little community here in Philadelphia, and we've been deeply disturbed by the patterns of gun violence. We have almost one homicide a day. And I remember how, to, in a real way, one of those was a 19-year-old kid that we heard the gunshots go out. We walked out and we saw him right in front of my house with, with bullets in his body. We prayed the Lord's Prayer. The ambulance came and we found out the next morning he died 19 years old. There comes a point, as Dr. Martin Luther King says, where 
It's good to be the good Samaritan and lift your neighbor out of the ditch. But after you lift so many people out of the ditch, you start to say maybe the whole road to Jericho needs to be repaved and rethought, that we need to reimagine the road where people keep getting beat up and left on the side of the road. So the Quakers and others in Philadelphia began to vigil outside of some of the most notorious gun shops. And these were gun shops that had over 200 guns sold there that were tracked to violent crimes on the streets. And I, I've learned a lot about it. I'd love to talk more with folks that want to. I've learned how it's happening. It's, it's terrible and heartbreaking. And so if the gun shop owners would engage us and we would create a conversation, and if they wouldn't, then we would continue to vigil and say, we want to talk with you. We're not trying to close you down. And eventually, some folks felt that they nonviolently needed to pray and to do an old-fashioned sit-in. So they put their bodies in front of the traffic of guns, just nonviolently praying and sitting in that gun shop. And they were removed and arrested and taken to court. And it was a showcase trial in Philly. Uh, schools were let out so the kids could come and see justice at work. And so what was beautiful was as they told their story and as the, the patterns of gun violence were exposed in our city, what really happened was that the gun shop went on trial. The judge found all the defendants not guilty. And the gun shop license was revoked. The gun shop was shut down and that was right around the corner about a block from here. That gun shop is no more. And I say that with a posture of humility because it wasn't our intention to shut. We believe in redemption that even the gun shop owner is not beyond redemption, amen? So we're gonna hire that brother to work for raw tools, okay? You know, like that. There, there's something redemptive in everything. So I think one of the things we gotta be careful of is self-righteousness. Right? When you get 4,000 people together, you feel like, well, we must be something, you know? But I think we got to be careful of that because it's that self-righteousness that is like the yeast of the Pharisees. It can infect us. It can make us think that this is our thing and that, this, that we are the pure ones and all those other people that don't care about justice, they're not real Christians, right? So we can get the self-righteousness that is poison to our soul. And so if we're not careful, we'll end up being like, hmm, I would never drink from a styrofoam cup, hmm, you know, huh. Starbucks, mm -hmm, I know about that. You know, I, I, ah, you came in an SUV. I drive a biodiesel hybrid. You know, I, 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 we got to be careful of that self-righteousness. And we got to be like the tax collector, just beating our chest saying, God have mercy on us sinners. There's not us in them. There is us. And there is a sinner and a saint in every one of us. And so we want Jesus to come alive in us that we can say, the life I live, I no longer live, but Jesus lives inside of me. So let me, uh, let, let me close by, by telling you a, a really old story that I, it's when my eyes kind of got open to grace. And uh, when I first moved to Philly from Tennessee, moved into North Philadelphia, and there's so much in my neighborhood that I'm proud of. Some of my, my friends and neighbors, uh, Miguel and, and, and Derek, and some of my friends are here today, and we're proud of our neighborhood. But there's, we've suffered deeply economically. The factory's left, and so we're left without, without a lot of jobs. And so now we're figuring out how to rebuild, reimagine our neighborhood together. And so there's a lot of pain, too. There's uh, drug trafficking and, and prostitution. And I remember one of the first times I was walking with one of my community mates from my house to the food store. And in order to get to the, the grocery store at the time, we had to walk down Kensington Avenue, which is a street filled with pain. There's a lot of ugly, hard things that happen on the avenue. So as we're walking to the store, one of the women on the avenue propositioned me, and I, I kind of felt really awkward, you know, and from East Tennessee, I didn't know quite know what to do. I was like, no, thank you, you know, like we went on the store, we got our food, and then we beelined back to the house, and we got back to the house, like, I just uh, kept thinking about that. We're unpacking our food bags, you know, and then we noticed that one of the, the bags of bread that I had gotten had a tear in the side, 
and all of uh, the bread was kind of crusty, but, you know, we didn't notice before. And so I look at my friend, I go, man, what are we going to do? She's like, my, my friend Michelle, she goes, we'll just take it back. I got the receipt. I'm like, awesome. You know, like that, that means we're going to have to walk back there, you know. And so we do. We go take our bread back, and we exchange our bread. But then on the way back, I look down in one of the alleyways, and I see that woman and she's just hunkered down, sitting on the ground, shivering in the cold. We knew full well we couldn't just pass her by. You know, we, we went into the alleyway and we bent down and started talking to her. And we said, listen, uh, we got a little place around the corner. If you need to get warm, if you, if you need somebody to talk to, if you need some food, we got some good bread, you know, come on back. So she jumped up. She followed us back to the house. And as we walk in the door, she just falls apart. She starts weeping and weeping. And she, my friend Michelle is just holding in her arms, rocking her like a little child. And as the woman kind of gathers herself, she looks up and, and she says the strangest thing. She goes, you guys are Christians, aren't you? And uh, I'm like, how'd you know? Like, we don't have a neon sign outside flashing repent or burn, you know? Like, there's no crosses on our house or anything. And uh and so she goes, I know you are because I can see it in your eyes. And she said, uh, I, you guys kind of shine with God's love. And she said, I used to shine like that too. I used to be so in love with God that I had a fire inside of me. And she said, I used to shine like the stars in the sky. And then she said, but it's a cold, dark world. And I've lost my shine on these old streets. These dark streets put my fire out. We wrapped her arms around her and we prayed with her that she would hear that whisper that she is beloved, that she is beautiful, and that she's a child of God, and that she would feel the fire begin to burn in her again. And, uh, and then we sent her out. And, you know, we didn't know if we'd see her again. Weeks and weeks passed. And then one night uh, there was a knock at the door. And I, I uh, opened the door. And, and there's this woman there, and she's just like, hey! And I'm like, whoa, do we know each other, you know? And she says, yeah, you just don't recognize me because I'm shining again. And I, I knew who she was then, right? And she starts talking 100 miles an hour, and she's like, I'm on fire again. I'm in love with God. And she said, I wanted to come back, and I just wanted to say thank you for bringing me in when I was at the bottom. And she said, I wanted to give you a little gift. And then uh, she said, oh, you could see her backpedal. And almost apologetically, she said, but I got to tell you, I lost pretty much everything I had on the streets, except I smoked a lot of cigarettes, a lot. And she said, and I always collected the Marlboro miles from the sides of the cigarette boxes, the little coupons. You can trade them in for stuff. And she said, hold on. She goes out the car. She pulls out this box and brings it back. And I can tell it's boiling over with Marlboro miles. And she's like, they're yours. <laughs> I'm like, awesome. You know, I'm like, great. I'll trade them in. Get me a. Marlboro tote bag or something, you know. Uh, but come to find out, I think it's one of the greatest gifts I've ever been given. And I later found that they make pretty good page markers for your Bible. So that's what I use them for. And I, every time I open my Bible and I look at that Marlboro mile, I'm reminded that this is the gospel of love and grace, that God is in the business of loving people back to life, of turning death into life, and hatred into love. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much.